Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue our series on white dwarf stars. The first two videos discuss the inability of ideal gases to gravitationally collapse to form a star or a white dwarf. The next two videos analyze the concerning use of gravitational redshifts, especially revealing problems with determining the temperatures of Sirius B. We are now left with the gravitational redshift as the only possible means of determining radius of a white dwarf star. As we saw previously, DA white dwarfs are characterized by strong bomber lines as can be seen in this spectrum taken by the Hubble telescope from Sirius B, the classic example of such a star. Balmer lines, if you remember, are spectroscopic lines of elemental hydrogen, which you can see in this figure. As stars are mainly made of hydrogen, the hydrogen lines become a frequent focus of astronomers. DA white dwarfs do not have readily apparent metallic or helium lines. Therefore, astronomers focus on the redshifts of Balmer lines in the optical range. The hydrogen redshifts in DA white dwarfs are used to argue for a small radius and an enormous density in the dwarf. Remember this equation, which tries to link a redshift of a star V sub G is redshift in kilometers per second, M is the number of solar masses, and R is the radius of the star compared to the Sun. The mass is well known from observing the orbit of Sirius B. The redshift of the hydrogen alpha line of Sirius B was measured by the Hubble telescope, as we discussed here. By claiming that the redshift is caused solely by gravity, the radius can be easily computed. Eddington and Chandrasekhar, who were the fathers of current white dwarf densities, wanted these redshifts to be explained by extreme gravity. However, if the hydrogen atoms producing the Balmer lines are involved in chemical coordination, then they can produce redshifts which can be explained without gravity. You might remember this quote from the last video where the stark pressure shift can produce additional shifts in white dwarf absorption lines. Laboratory-based studies simulating white dwarf plasma environment have demonstrated that this effect could account for up to 50% of the measured redshift, depending on the lines used and the amount of broad line wings included when measuring the wavelength. Of course, it is impossible to know the proper condition in the laboratory to mimic the atmosphere of a white dwarf. For example, this paper models a white dwarf atmosphere in the laboratory by producing plasma using an electrical arc in a hydrogen argon mixture. What evidence is there that this mimics the atmosphere of a white dwarf? This laboratory experiment will generate free protons and electrons near any observed hydrogen atom, which lowers the net effective electric field experienced by the hydrogen. However, in a star, if the electrons could be channeled away, then the atom would be faced with a very positive electric field. In the liquid metallic hydrogen model of the Sun, it has already been proposed that condensed matter in the corona channels electrons back onto the solar surface, as we saw in this video. The solar atmosphere, as a result, is positively charged. That hasn't been investigated in laboratory plasmas modeling stars and could make this effect the actual cause of the redshift in white dwarfs. In this context, let us imagine a free hydrogen atom and a proton which was modeled theoretically in this same paper and is presented in figure 1. In order to understand this figure, recall that the Bohr radius is the average distance between a hydrogen proton and its electron. But in this figure, even at a distance of 30 Bohr radii between a hydrogen atom and a proton, the model produces extremely powerful and synchronous shifts in all components of the hydrogen alpha line. A quasi-hydrogen molecular cation would have an even stronger effect because the internuclear distances would be just a few Bohr radii. Strangely, the authors claim that the hydrogen alpha line in white dwarfs will not experience stark dependent redshifts despite disproving that claim with their very own figure. In reality, stark effects can easily account for 100% of the redshifts observed on Sirius B. Joyce et al. actually discount the effect of stark redshifts. For the wavelength ranges we have chosen, 7 to 19 angstroms, the effect of the stark shift is expected to be below 1 km per second based on simulation 
and observations of plasma in the laboratory. They then cite the electric arc paper we just discussed, which could have absolutely nothing to do with real conditions on a white dwarf. A key paper presenting stark broadening tables in astrophysics discusses two models, MMM and VCS, but the details of the models themselves are not important. What they say is important. Both VCS and MMM descriptions have the limitation of not taking into account quasi-molecules that form with the perturbers during the collision with the hydrogen atoms. These quasi-molecules produce so-called satellite lines at large distances from the line center. The collision of neutral hydrogen with other neutral hydrogen atoms, for example, leads to the temporary formation of the 1600 angstrom feature a conspicuous broad depression in the UV flux of white dwarfs and boo stars. The information in this quotation is exactly what would invalidate all hydrogen-based density measurements using red shifts in the DA white dwarfs. This makes us ask, in the UV spectrum for Sirius B, is there evidence of a broad depression around 1600 angstroms? In a paper by Kitter et al. in 2005, the authors fit the UV spectrum of Sirius B with a line, but they also plot the expected UV spectrum of a completely unrelated star, Delta Ursi Minoris. This is because they suggest that their UV spectrum could be polluted by Sirius A, a class of stars similar to Delta Ursi Minoris. On the right side of the figure, from 1550 to 1950 angstroms, about 40% of the flux measured could be coming from Sirius A, given the spectrum of Ursi Minoris. Yet they have no observational basis for claiming that the spectrum of Sirius B is contaminated. The problem is that there is something in the spectrum that they do not like. If we replot their figure, assuming that their spectrum is good, and use our own line, the region near 1600 angstroms shows a small depression exactly where we might expect the signature of a quasi-hydrogen molecule. Again, this is sufficient to invalidate all redshift measurements on Sirius B as supporting extreme densities because it opens up the possibility that stark effects caused the shifts. By claiming that there was contamination involved, this important feature was hidden from the reader. Whether that was intentional or not, I'll let you decide. To strengthen the point, let's look at a few more lines of evidence. First, a paper by Nealon and Wegner in 1985. The abstract states, the lambda 1600 absorption feature in the spectra of cool DA white dwarf stars has been identified as a resonance broadening of Lyman alpha due to the hydrogen quasi molecule. Likewise, the lambda 1400 absorption feature in the spectra of cool and moderately warm DA white dwarf stars appears to be due to a Lyman alpha satellite line arising from the hydrogen ion quasi molecule, that is, H2. The strength of both features is gravity sensitive and therefore promises to be an excellent indicator of surface gravity. So this paper explicitly states that the quasi-hydrogen molecules are present in DA white dwarfs, invalidating all attempts to ascertain densities from redshift measurements. Still, the authors do claim that this can be linked to surface gravity, but can we prove this wrong as well? The problem is that the 1600 angstrom feature is also seen in Lambda Buddha stars, which have a surface gravity similar to the Sun. In a paper published nearly 10 years later, the authors write, the nature of the absorption feature near 1600 angstroms in Lambda Buddha stars, which is one of the strongest features in these objects, is a long-standing puzzle. In this study, we demonstrate that it is caused by quasi-molecular absorption leading to a satellite in the Lyman alpha profile due to perturbations by neutral hydrogen. A little below in the paper, the authors comment on the difficulty they faced in making the assignment. However, it was felt that the pressure in the atmosphere of main sequence stars is far too low to produce a comparable absorption. Of course, the conclusion in the last sentence was flawed. Powerful surface gravity is not required whatsoever. The authors were simply swayed by the erroneous idea that white dwarfs are ultra-dense stars. 
But are there other examples of interactions like these in the spectrum outside the 1600 angstrom depression? The answer is yes. In 1985, Koester et al. in analyzing the spectrum of DA white dwarf stars stated, it has now become clear that the case of L532-81 as well as of the newly observed star L362-81 are only cooler examples of the same phenomenon. That this can indeed be explained by quasi-molecular hydrogen absorption was demonstrated in the following calculations. At the same time, we provide an answer to the question of the nature of the 1400 angstrom feature. It is a satellite caused by H2 plus absorption. So now, how about this new 1400 angstrom feature? A white dwarf with the name of 40 Iridiani b provides a wonderful spectrum provided by Greenstein. The dashed line with the two arrowheads marks the location of the depression. The figure legend states, the location of possible H2 features is shown. Greenstein et al. did not originally suspect that assignment. It was brought to his attention by the reviewer. Greenstein had wanted to assign the depression to silicon 4, which required much higher temperatures than are now accepted for 40 Iridiani b. It turns out that the 1400 angstrom depression is associated with the quasi-molecular hydrogen cation. Taken together, these papers unintentionally prove that DA white dwarfs have quasi-hydrogen molecules in their atmospheres. This is a terrible blow to any claim that red shifts in such dwarfs must be interpreted based on gravity. To recap, there are about three star types that possess either 1400 angstroms or 1600 angstrom depressions in their UV spectra. The first, of course, is the DA white dwarf. These stars have widened, absorptive Balmer lines and are thought to be devoid of metallic features. When one hydrogen atom interacts with another hydrogen atom or a proton at the time of absorption, such as when quasi-molecules are present, a Balmer line can become redshifted, and significantly so. In addition, Einstein coefficients for photon absorption and stimulated emission also exist, as we saw in this video. These coefficients only apply to free atoms. If even a brief interaction exists with another atom at the time of absorption, such as would be the case when quasi-molecules are present, then the Einstein coefficients for photon absorption can become much larger and as a result, the absorption can become much stronger. This could well explain why the Balmer lines in DA white dwarfs are so powerful. These stars are known to have quasi-hydrogen molecules present and that can affect the broadening of the line, its intensity and its shifts. Lambda Buddha stars, which also have the 1600 angstrom features caused by quasi-molecules, are said to have very low metal content but have similar Balmer line absorption features. In this figure, taken from Gray and Corbali, four stars are being compared. The top and the bottom spectra are from main sequence stars, which you can ignore. The two middle spectra are from Lambda Buddha stars. It is argued that the magnesium 2 line at 4481 is much weaker in Lambda Buddha stars. However, the line is clearly present in the second and third spectrum. It is just that the Balmer lines are so powerful. This is the same effect as we see in DA white dwarfs. The Balmer lines are being enhanced in Lambda Buddha stars as well. The third type of star that contains evidence for quasi-molecular hydrogen are the horizontal branch stars. These are stars where the metal content is thought to be low and the Balmer lines are once again known to be strong as can be seen in this figure. Astrophysicists must contend with the fact that the atmospheres of DA white dwarfs are well known to contain quasi-hydrogen molecules and ions leading to a simple explanation for the red shifts observed without absurd gravities and density values. The presence of these molecules should have been discussed in all modern papers about supposed gravitational redshifts in DA white dwarfs and redshifts for every Balmer line should be reported instead of picking and choosing the most convenient such as the hydrogen alpha line. Failure to mention the presence of these quasi-hydrogen molecules was a serious distortion of observational facts.
the UV spectrum of DA white dwarfs matter, and their contents must not be discounted, especially if one wants to claim outlandish densities. Furthermore, since it is understood that quasi-hydrogen molecules and quasi-hydrogen molecular cations can exist in DA white dwarfs, then their presence can never be discounted in any DA white dwarf atmosphere, including that of Sirius B. This is true whether or not one believes that the dip seen in this figure is real. We must simply assume that quasi-hydrogen molecules exist in the atmosphere of Sirius B and that their presence can produce a strong redshift. That is because such molecules are known to exist in other DA white dwarfs. Indeed, the Stark effects can be much greater than 50%. In addition, since each line can be affected differently, that is why it is so important to report the redshifts of every visible Balmer line. This was done in early papers, but modern papers on Sirius B, for instance, have chosen to focus solely on the hydrogen alpha line and fail to report, as they should have, the redshifts associated with all the other lines. In my opinion, when combined with the fact that Eddington's mass luminosity expression provided an invalid basis for assuming that ultra-dense white dwarfs even existed, the presence of quasi-hydrogen molecules provides powerful proofs that these stars are not ultra-dense. We are dealing with stars of ordinary density that simply have a different lattice. And an atmosphere containing quasi-hydrogen molecules and quasi-hydrogen molecular cations, which act to both strengthen and shift the Balmer lines. In our next video, we will continue our exploration of white dwarfs, especially the metallic lines. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.